So your team has just failed to convert a third and three. Suddenly, 11 new bodies arrive onto the field with hopes of pinning your opponent back and stifling their potential offense, thus solidifying the belief that football is the ultimate game of chess and that the next move is greater than the current one. But why exactly is your team prioritizing this maneuver? Well, the main argument offered is field position. Pushing the opposing players further from scoring position increases the number of plays an opponent must perform perfectly and thus decreases the probability of producing points. But the math is all wrong here. So why have NFL and college coaches failed to work out what every 8-year-old playing Madden has? Well, we'll be breaking down the math to show you why punting is stupid, sorry Rich Eisen, and speak to Coach Kelly of Pulaski Academy whose high school team has only punted 8 times in the last 14 years. 4th and 7 can always go for for me. Winning 8 state championships. Welcome to Football Theory, a series where we dive deep into some of the game's biggest questions. So first, let's talk about everyone's least favorite subject in school. Math. Wait, don't go clicking on that compilation of trick plays just yet. We promise to make it fun. Now, to work out if you should go for it, this clever man, David Romer, used data from the 1998 to 2000 seasons to work out the estimated value of both kicking and attempting to convert the fourth down for each yard of field position. We don't have the time, nor do you guys have the attention span, to go through the impressive but complex econ algebra Romer used, but the results can be seen on this graph. The x-axis shows field position. The y-axis shows the yards to go, and the red line shows where the value of kicking and going for it are equal. Anywhere in the shaded red area, a team who goes for it has a greater expected points than a team who simply chooses to boot the ball away. If we jump back to our fourth and three question from earlier, we can see that no matter where the team was on the field, it would have always been advantageous to go for it. The average starting position in the NFL at the time was around the 25, mainly skewed by touchbacks, and with such a large amount of field to go, punting the ball away has some advantage here, and thus the graph is near its lowest. The line steadily increases as the field position is eaten into. Every punt from the 50 can only go a maximum of 49 yards. At midfield, teams should definitely be going for it at 4th and 5-6, to six, no matter the game situation. The tipping point of the graph comes around the 33-yard line where kicking for the uprights becomes possible. Remember, this graph encompasses all forms of kicking, not just punts. And now that there are points available, the push for the fresh set of downs is less clear-cut. The graph pumps back up slightly as teams get closer to goal and the touchdown becomes more likely, before the expected points mirror the yards available to go inside the five. Essentially, Inside your opponent's 5-yard line, you should ALWAYS be going for it, as even a failed attempt leaves your opponent with the length of the field still to travel. But what about the other end of the scale? Inside your own 5, the graph seems counterintuitive. The closer you get to your goal line, the more you should be willing to risk it. Coach Kelly does a good job of explaining this bit of thinking. If let, Let's say that I've got the ball on my own 3-yard line, and it's 4th and, you know, nine or whatever and if i punt it from that point and because football coaches don't know this but because you're on your own three you'll do a tight punt formation where they can't block it usually you net less yards on your punt because now you can't get down there and cover it as well all this kind of stuff so the net punt at that point at that point in time and they really don't deviate from high school to the nfl very much but the net punt the net punt from there was like 33 yards when you're on your own three yard line if you punt it from there, your three-yard line, they're going to get the ball on the 37-yard line. By, by all these college games, they're going to score a touchdown on average when they get the ball there. This is before expected points for each yard line. But they're going to score a touchdown 77% of the time. That's what every number is. If you acquire the ball on the 37, you're going to score 77. Let's take it all back and go, if you go for it and don't make it, they're going to score a touchdown 92% of the time from that point. 92, okay? There's only a 15% difference. Now, what is your chances? What are your chances of making the first down if you knew on first down that you were going to go for it on fourth down, no matter where you were right there, 
you know, your chances are going to be good enough where you offset that 15%. And in, in effect, you should never punt. Now the graph might be a little bit off having utilized data from the 1998 to 2000 seasons, back when the league was much less pass friendly than the modern NFL. But that actually means that this line should probably be even higher up. But Coach Kelly foregoes the straight mathematics and goes for it no matter what. But why? The numbers themselves will tell you to punt certain times that I don't. But I realize the numbers that none of these guys will take into consideration, and that is the amount of time I save every single day in practice by not having to do that. When a specific mindset comes to be the consciousness of the general population, it can be hard to break that habit, even with clear evidence to the contrary. The punt is seen as a positive play for the team, despite really just being another form of a turnover. By viewing punts for what they truly are, a turnover, you can start to see why going for it is so worth it. You forego giving the opponent control of the ball and still have the chance to score for yourself. Outside of the straight mathematical benefit a team may acquire from not punting, there are multiple intangibles to support this case. Well, you can't put a value, so if you're looking for a scientific basis, you can't put a value on this. But for my defense, you know, I'm good with the psychological part of the game and the motivational part too as well, I think. Nobody knows what the real benefit of that is. But I've convinced our defense that you need to take pride when we turn the ball over on our own 15-yard line. Nobody else trusts their defense to go out and defend a 15-yard field. We do it, and we expect you not only to, to, to do it, we expect you to be successful at it, not let them in the end zone. You know what I'm saying? And, and what that's done is that transformed the way my kids think on defense. So why do coaches still punt? Well, David Romer speculates a number of reasons. A great football coach's skill may not necessarily translate to mathematics. The skill required to teach fundamentals and put your players through drills to increase their skill aren't necessarily the same skills for spotting counterintuitive math-based puzzles in an already complex sport. Coaches are afraid of looking stupid and there's a certain amount of that's the way we've always done it. If I said name the football coach last year of the Dallas Cowboys, any NFL fan could, could tell you who that was and they could pick a picture of him out with his little red hair and his red face and clapping when they come off the field whether they do good or bad you know everybody would know jason garrett's the guy if i said the team that's right beside him in major league baseball the texas rangers name that coach nobody knows who the guy is they couldn't pick him out of a lineup now i say all that to say the coach and the quarterback and the stars of the nfl are still the faces of the team and in the NFL, if you go, you know, coaches now have to hire analytics companies. They just won't listen to them. But if they, they're afraid, I, I, I think they're afraid if they do, that people will start saying, well, God, all you got to do is listen to the analytics people. Anybody can win. And that the ego won't let them do that because then it's like, well, if they start thinking we're not important, well, I still have a job. You know, oh, he's winning because the analytics people. The last reason is risk aversion. Humans in general have a preference for a sure outcome over a gamble, even when the gamble may have a much higher payoff or better odds. And that's exactly what we see in punting. Sure, a punt isn't necessarily a guaranteed positive for your team's overall expected chances of winning, but it does give you a sure-ish outcome that you're going to make it harder for the opposition to score, and real tangible yards that are easy to point to. Compare that to gambling on a fourth and two. Even though this isn't really a gamble and the odds are massively in your favor, failing to convert and coming away with nothing is a quick way to get booed by the home fans and, honestly, potentially lose your job, even if it's the correct choice. They're scared of what might happen, even maybe to their career, uh, if they don't, instead of thinking about the good it can bring. And there's a lot of irony in that. For instance, I had a coach sit here and tell me, you know, he's at, a, he's at an SEC school, and he said, if on Saturday it's fourth and one in the first quarter, and by all percentages, I should go for it, even if it's on my own 30-yard line. And I do and lose the game. They will blame me. That's what lost the game right there. You didn't make it. They went and scored a touchdown. It changed the psychology of the game. You lost the game. Da, 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 da. I might not have a job on Monday if that happens because they can fire me. And if that happens, all my assistants won't be kept for next year either because some new coach will come in. He'll bring all his. You always bring – you, you want to have guys you trust. He goes, so that's what will happen. You know, and then I told him, ironically enough, if we could not fire you then, the big picture of time, it's going to help you win more games and keep your job. 
but they can't get past that one moment. Punting is not without merit. Pushing your opponent further back does make it harder to score. And when pushing the ball inside the opposition eight yard line, it forces extreme pressure on the offense to gain yards for their punter or risk having to punt the ball from a reduced formation. There is also the argument for weather conditions. Expected points utility and other such statistics go out of the window when there's six inches of snow on the ground. And this is actually how punting got a foothold in the NFL. In the early days, the game's resemblance was much closer to that of a modern day rugby, only with a down system. The forward pass wasn't legalized until 1906 and combining slow 11 versus 11 ground and pound with waterlogged muddy fields made for a slow tactical thumper of a game. In this era of hard running and high turnovers, punts were much more frequent. Why drag the ball 80 yards through the mud when you can punt it to your opponent and strip it off them at their own 20 yard line? Punting was much more prevalent in the early days of football, only being relegated to the fourth down sacrifice in the 1950s. However, Coach Kelly came into a few problems when trying to implement the punt in bad weather game. You know, I, I worried about that at first. What I found is the more I worried about, the more kids worried about, the worse we did. I now treat it like it doesn't matter. And I'd never let us, we don't have an indoor. I won't let them build one because I don't want, because I want to practice in the elements we play. So fortunately we get to practice a lot in the rain too. And I changed the way they can catch the ball. Instead of catching with their hands, I let them catch it in the soft spot of their bodies, which is you know a counter to every other coach in the world. But but they're able to catch a higher percentage of balls. But what I'm saying is, as soon as we started practicing for it and and not shunning it and going, God, we got to deal with the rain. As soon as we quit doing that and started embracing it and making sure we didn't go in the gym to practice or go in anywhere else, find an indoor, the world changed for us. The more you dictate the way you play because of the weather, obviously the less efficient you're gonna, you're gonna be because your whole team, my whole team is bound on the efficiency. And so if I'm changing that, I'm already, I'm already letting the weather affect us before it even affects us with what I'm calling and the way we're playing. So you combine the fact that we embrace the weather physically and then I don't let it change the way we play the game at all then we've been even better because the other teams are letting it affect what they'll call. Third and seven, they may try to run it and make it anyway. We know that's a low percentage chance, so they'll go ahead and punt it and, and play defense. Well, you know, I'm not doing that. And, and I think, you know, I, yeah, I'm not doing it. I think it's helping. With the introduction of the forward pass and the ever adapting rule changes that allow quarterbacks to spray the ball around, punts should have fallen to a mere historic cliff note of the NFL, much like straight leg kicking and middle bar face masks. Instead, punts remain a statistical advantage ready to be exploited through the subtraction of instant gratification. Coaches too stuck in their ways continue to perpetuate the myth that punts are good and not just another turnover akin to having a deep pass picked off. So I ask you, will this ever change? Well, there has been a small rise in the number of goal for it calls over the last four decades with the largest number of attempts happening in the previous season. However, 595 attempts only equates to just over two a game, with many of these taking place in garbage time. With several papers on the subject and a wildly successful high school coach going no pun, you would expect to see more of it in the future. But maybe the entrenched ways of the old guard will continue to let risk aversion hold them back from making the future of football look wildly different. Thank you for watching. A special thanks goes to Coach Kevin Kelly for his foresight on the topic, and a thank you to both Dr. David Romer and Dr. Kevin Quinn, whose research much of this video is based on. Links to their work and any of the papers mentioned can be found in the description below.